the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts and considerations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's grace and every blessing be to you this day, in and through our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of his life given. Holy Spirit. The text for today that serves as the foundation of our sermon is written in the book of the prophet Malachi. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge? or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the arrogant, blessed, evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test, and they escape. Here ends the text. As we continue to grow in light and maturity, beloved, there are many times that we take for self-reflection, whether it be in our time of silence and of prayer, or in the midst of the workaday world in which we all must live. Most poignant of those times of reflection, at least for me, when you take that time in the morning Prepare yourself to put on that face to begin a new day, to present yourself before people. We must consider then ourselves as we look in that mirror. And as we look in the mirror, I imagine that there are any number of things that we see, both, both rather in hopefulness for the future, and sadly perhaps, and regret for the past. As I look in the mirror over the years, I've seen an awful lot of gray hair come. Not much of it is gone, thanks be to God. But one more thing that really perhaps doesn't sit so well is the common refrain that all too often I hear in the back of my head, in the midst of my heart, as I look at what I am and have become, what I have been granted in this life, and all too often I compare it with things that have been given to others. And I see that child, four, five, six, seven years old, who comments with the refrain all too often, it's not fair. I'm not sure if you guys have ever spoken or thought those words, but my guess is that you have. Whether we be young and not getting the toy that we want to play with with our friends or family, whether we be teens who are growing who believe our parents are nothing more than those set out to make our life a miserable existence, if it be we who begin our career don't have the paycheck that those who gain further on down the road, or if as we age, there are those who have lived a far harder life than we, whose bodies and minds are healthy, while we struggle day by day. It's not fair, is a common refrain. And it's not common only to us today. We hear the same here in the prophet Malachi. The people of God turn to God and say, well, what's the point? Really, in layman's terms, what is it that we're supposed to do and why should we? There seems to be no reward in following the Lord, in living a life in regard to His command. For those who do wrong, the evildoers prosper. 
And those who put God to the test have escaped his wrath. And so that little child and spoiled brat inside of me stops and screams, it's not fair. Maybe it's not. Matter of fact, the truth is, it isn't. Neither is life. Your parents or grandparents told you just like they did me. The fair comes to town once a year. <laughs> you ever heard that one? No? Apparently, I have grandparents that really have all those problems done. Beloved, when we speak of fairness, we must speak of God's justice. We spoke of it in our confession. God, who is faithful and just. When we cry out against those who seem to have it far better than we in this world, and we cry out about fairness, it's not really and only calling into question those who have prospered by questionable means. But as God indicated at the beginning of this reason, reading, you are speaking against me. You have spoken hard words, says the Lord. But you say, what? What do we do? God refrains. It's vain to serve God. Why should we? What are we going to get out of it? Seems to be the line of questioning. <clears throat> now here in Malachi, as well as throughout the scripture, particularly in the Psalms, as many of you may know, there is this cry for justice that the things that are so wrong in this world might be made right, that those who endeavor, like you, to do good can't ever seem to get the upper hand. And that brings frustration. And frustration brings hostility, which grows to anger, which sometimes turns away from God and inward to self. The devil's desire is to take those things with which we struggle, fairness and equity, equality, and all good things that we expect here and now, and make us somehow believe that it is God who is refraining from either giving to us what we have deserved or giving to others what they have earned by their reward. In either case, it is we who have placed ourselves above God, letting God know what is good and right, telling our Lord what His timetable ought to be. This text is one that calls us to trust, to believe, that despite what our eyes see and our lives experience, that our God and Father has all things in His good order, that the will of God is right and holy and perfect. I can't make up my mind about the things that I do throughout the day or throughout the week, and I make mistake upon mistake and sin after sin, as do we all. And we heard it exclaimed there by that criminal, hanging with our Lord, as he spoke to the one who confronted Jesus, if you are the Christ, save us, and yourself. But the wise criminal, the one who was repentant, spoke these words, do you not fear God, since you are under the same condemnation, and we justly, justly, because we are guilty of our offenses, but this man has done nothing wrong. We could place ourselves, the people at the time of Malachi, or any at either hand of our Lord, criminal 
criminals condemned because of our guilt. And we must confess, rightly so, for we are bearing the punishment of what we have done. That in truth is justice. That in truth is fairness. Thanks be unto God that he is not fair, as we measure fairness. Paul wrote to the Colossians, and he spoke about how God delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into his wonderful kingdom of light. And how was it done? By our having succeeded in the things that we endeavor to see as right and good and godly? No, rather it speaks of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is born in his body our sins, in whom God was willing and pleased to dwell bodily. Thereby in Christ our God comes to us, the author of life, the perfecter of faith, the beginning and the end. This God has in fairness taken upon himself that burden that we cannot bear. He has taken upon himself that guilt of which we would have been condemned. He has taken into his body our death and has borne it for you, our love and the hopefulness that you would see and receive this gift and trust that God will make all things right. At the end of Malachi, and the end of our reading, God makes it plain as he does throughout the scripture. Once more then will you see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not. Today is what we celebrate as the last Sunday in the church year. At once it was called Christ the King, and there were readings and portrayals of our Lord on his glorious throne. But in recent years, the readings have changed to what we have today, Christ on the cross. Because it is by that death and resurrection that our Lord Jesus Christ reigned, even as we prayed. Lord God, you reign by your cross, having overcome sin and death, by having borne the unfairness and the injustice that all of us have mustered throughout our lives and failed. But as it said again in Colossians, God was and Marcus were beloved for yourself. He was pleased to allow that to be, so that he might bring before him those saints, you saints, all who would believe with the host of angels in heaven, that when the day of his glorious coronation does come, that you might be gathered up with the faithful. And it is on that day that we will know and that we will see. It is when the sheep are separated from the goat and the wheat from the tares that we will see who we are in Christ. And this calls for faith today. It's exceedingly easy to be caught up and to fall down in the injustice of this world, wondering why we, who are Christians, who should turn the other cheek and walk the extra mile, don't seem to receive the extra water or sustenance along the way. But Paul was struggling with what he called the thorn in the flesh, he called upon God, not once, but three times, to remove this from me, and our Lord's answer came to him, my grace 
is sufficient for you. Beloved, it is not easy. It is rather the gift of God and the working of the Holy Spirit by which we can see God's glory and justice, the goodness of our Father, despite what we experience day after day in this world. We are not called upon to see God's justice yet, but to believe His Word. And so whether we struggle in poverty or loneliness, with sickness or ill health, or other frustrations that go along with life in this world, take heart and trust in God. For He has promised that all things will be made right. Maybe not now, and maybe not tomorrow, and maybe not even in your lifetime. But to be certain, all things will be set right according to that will of God. After Thanksgiving this week, services on Wednesday evening and Thursday morning, mind you, after Thanksgiving this week, we'll be celebrating the beginning of a new church year, Advent. That word simply means to come. And so we end our church year hoping for that coming soon, that we might be encouraged as we see the evil prosper and those who do wrong succeed. And we who endeavor to do right continually struggle. Our Lord is at hand. But as the Lord spoke through St. Peter, so he speaks to you. Do not consider his slowness in coming as do men. For he is being patient. That many others might come to repentance and thereby be saved. Beloved, that is our calling. Not to judge the world or our life in it, but to trust in God, to proclaim His coming, and to proclaim His coming again, to encourage and uphold each other in time of weakness, of sorrow, of illness, and in death. For we, for you, are the very hands and feet of our Lord Jesus Christ, sent to the lost and called upon to open, to embrace those in need. Beloved, together we are in need. May God strengthen in us a desire and prayerful hopefulness to be able to begin to encourage, to embrace, to uplift and hold one another in this time of trial and upset, knowing all the time that God is faithful and just, and as His coming comes soon, it will be one of joy for us all. The Word of God calls us to trust. May God the Holy Spirit work in you by His Word and this gift of His supper, an enduring trust in this Word of God that says when you see these things begin to happen, straighten up and lift up your heads, for your redemption is at hand. Trust in the Lord, beloved. He is faithful. And he will do. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all our understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds always in Christ Jesus, and bring us all, even to life eternal.